Hey there, I'm Eric Doggett, and this is Photog TV, hosted by myself and Dustin Meyer. Episode 8 for Thursday, November 17th, 2011, Bridal Portrait Breakdown. We talk some photo news, including changes to Adobe's Photoshop upgrade policy, using an iPhone for HDR photography, plus Dustin's going to show us some of his bridal portrait images and tell us how he went about creating them. Hi everyone, I'm Eric Doggett and welcome to another episode of Photog TV. This is episode 8, it's Thursday, November 17th. And uh, today we're going to cover some photo news as well as uh, have Dustin. He's going to show us some of his wedding images and kind of talk us through the the process he went through to shoot them and to edit them and just a little bit of a roundtable discussion on those. So how's it going, Dustin? Good to see you. It's going great. It's good to see you again. Yeah, so yeah, we got some people here in the room. We got some regulars as well. I see Deb's here. Um, One day I think we're going to have to bribe her to actually turn on a video camera because she's... Or she could at least use her studio logo as her little picture thing, so at least, you know, we can associate yeah, that with her. There's, just a, there's a black space there, and I feel like it's a lonely space that needs some, needs some video love. Deb is lost in the void. <laughs> Poor Deb. <laughs> and I'm going to do a quick shout-out to my friend Jerry Hannon. Uh, he is in our show for the first time today, and uh, so Jerry... Thanks for coming. Jerry's a great studio photographer as well as an event photographer. He even got me in on a few uh, executive Dell retreat events stuff. That's this cool. Year, so that, that's always fun. But um, so uh, so I guess we'll let's start the news section. Why don't you start out with what you? Uh, yeah, we came across uh, two interesting stories this week that I thought I'd share. One was that uh, Adobe, and this is kind of under the radar. I didn't. I heard about this uh, from a friend of mine who sent me a message about it, and then I had to kind of go digging for it. But Adobe has made a change to their upgrade policy. So before, with Photoshop, if you wanted to upgrade to the latest version, you paid some sort of upgrade fee that was like maybe a hundred bucks or something, hundred fifty bucks, uh, as far as just the Photoshop part of the their package, and um, and you could get the upgrade. But now they've they've made a change, and I'm gonna. Uh, post a link to a story from uh, a website about this where now you need to have the most recent version to get upgrade pricing so I put that link there in the in the group chat area so for example CS6 is slated to come out some point next year uh, in 2012 according to this you would need to have already owned at least uh, CS 5.0 before you were eligible to uh, pay the upgrade pricing um, So if you have like an earlier version, three or four, it's not really clear how much it would cost. I don't don't think it would be necessarily the full price, but it's definitely not going to be the upgrade pricing that we're used to paying when it's like, ah, the new version's out. I've got a version that's like 10 years old. I'm going to use that uh, serial number to get that upgrade. So if you're looking to upgrade, maybe maybe now will be the time or or, or at least look for some clarification on, on pricing. What do you... I'm running... Five, Dustin. What are you? What are you running? You know, I'm actually still running four. I'm kind of an old school guy, and honestly, I think the biggest reason why I haven't uh, upgraded to five is because um, 95% of what I do is in Lightroom three, and okay. the I think the only time I ever open a photo in Photoshop is to use Liquify. Um, I don't do a lot of the compositing like you do. And most of my stuff is either batch processing wedding photos or if it's something cosmetic, I can usually fit, uh, fix it with the spot healing inside Lightroom or um, even using the noise reduction tool or some of the other adjustment brushes that are built in to Lightroom 3. Um, and even you know the, the watermarking tool, I use that all the time in Lightroom 3, especially uh, with the senior portraits when I'm posting them on Facebook so they can use them for their profile photos. I definitely want to, you know, watermark those with my studio name on them, and um, Lightroom 3 makes that really easy. So all I have to do is, you know, select the images that I've already edited to go to the lab and then just create, you know, like Facebook copies that will have my logo on them and uh, just run a batch, have it done, and then upload them, and, and it's finished. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, CS5 and CS6, I think, you know, CS6 is going to be amazing. I've heard a lot of great things, especially about the content aware brush in CS5, but um, I think a lot of times, too, uh, I, I don't know. I just um, I haven't really found the need to upgrade to CS5 from CS4. 
Yeah, it is one of those apps that you can kind of continue using older versions and and get the functionality out of it that you need unless you're really, I mean, even with, um, let's see, 5 came out, and then I think it was 5.5 came out after that, but I don't, I'm not sure if there were any changes to Photoshop in that new version. But um, it, it if you're kind of in the group that, upgraded like to the Intel when they when they came out with the Intel versions that that's probably right now the baseline for everything anything after that uh, is on a feature by feature thing but but from the Intel version on um, you're probably covered uh, or at least a lot of people are covered by what's the Nair plus whether they use Lightroom or Aperture and and what those those tools provide and they haven't I haven't read anything particular to this also applying to Lightroom which just seems to be Photoshop for now. I guess like one of the benefits it used to be, and it, it wasn't affecting me so much because I wasn't like a big shop, but if you were uh, had a couple people working for you and the way Photoshop works with their licensing, you get two licenses. So you could do one on like a desktop and one on a laptop. If you had uh, someone else that you wanted working on it uh, and you didn't want to pay the full price, but you had maybe, whoops, sorry about that, you had a uh, earlier version of like three or four or something like that uh, that you don't use anymore, you could effectively use that serial number to get a um, upgrade price uh, on, on a new version just for that, that extra install. But uh, maybe that's what they're trying to do away with. So interesting story. Uh, if, it, if it affects you at all, check out that story. And then I think Adobe also has uh, a, pay, a post on their site, kind of like what this means to you kind of a thing, how they're going to handle pricing in the future. You know, and, and just a, a note to anybody else that's watching, um, there are real people that work at Adobe. I have um, multiple times I've purchased the wrong version of a software or, in fact, at one point I have a PC down in my studio that I just use for doing presentations for my clients, but then I have my Mac Pro Tower that I use in my production room. Um, and I think at one point I was upgrading from Lightroom 1 to Lightroom 2 a couple of years ago and I actually only had Lightroom 1 on my PC, and I wanted to get Lightroom 2 on my Mac. And I don't remember exactly the chain of events of how things happened, but I was able to talk to somebody, and they were able to actually get me the upgrade price for Lightroom 2 for my Mac, even though I had only purchased Lightroom 1 for the PC. And I, I got that by talking to somebody. So depending on your situation, don't feel like you're kind of boxed into a certain, you know, uh, scenario, you know, you can definitely talk to people there and uh, usually they're pretty helpful. Yeah, that's good to know. Make the phone call. Um, second news story, and this one might have a potential to uh, run a little bit more uh, longer. There was a, uh, a Brian Williams on NBC News had a interview recently with Annie Leibovitz and they got into a discussion on, uh, you know, what is the camera to buy for everyone? And it wasn't too surprising to me, but to him it was quite surprising that she kind of really uh, sang praises for the iPhone. She pulled it out right there and said, this has become the new um, the new pocket camera, and I'm going to post a little link from that. You got, it. you got it. Great. And so uh, she took a picture of him right there on the set, and and he was surprised that, that uh, she was recommending that as the kind of camera to, you know, to have. And it made, it got me thinking, we're where the market is and where it's going as far as point and shoots. You know, we were always like, we had our point and shoot and we had our DSLR and um, tried to have one or the other. Where were you, Dustin, on that? Are you, do you still have a point and shoot or do you even bother taking it out anymore? <laughs> the last point and shoot that I bought was the Canon 780iS uh, power shot. And the reason I got that one is because it's really small. It's, an, it's like the ELF series. It had a black aluminum anodized casing on it with rounded corners. It was, about, it was actually a little bit smaller than a deck of cards, and I think it took 12 megapixel images, plus it had um, a decent zoom range on it. Maybe I think the widest it would go is equivalent to about a 35 millimeter, but um, not as wide as I would like. But it would also do 720p HD video with image stabilization, which at the time was way better than what the uh, the flip camera, the flip video camera was capable of. It was before they even came out with image stabilization. And I think um, I think the price for uh, for that camera was about 350 or so at the time and the flip camera was about 200. So for me, um, I don't know, I just I really seem to like it even just the way it fit in my pocket. 
the fact that it can work with an iFi card, um, and the fact, I mean, basically the fact that it had a zoom lens on it and it had, you know, the HD video with stabilization was a really big sell for me. But I think ever since I upgraded, I, I think even as far back as my iPhone 3GS, um, I just hadn't been using that point and shoot as much. And especially now that I've upgraded to the iPhone 4S, um, I just, I don't think I'll ever need a point and shoot again. You notice a big difference in that 4S in the camera in the 4S? I do, and I think for, um, you know, they talk about how there's five lens elements or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I, who cares? My thing is um, how good does it take pictures in, indoors, you know, because that was always one of the problems with, uh, with uh, cameras on people's phones, on the iPhones, is that um, it still just wasn't quite bright enough to get indoor shots without using a flash. And now it's just it's not an issue. It's um, it's it's a much brighter lens. I think the maximum aperture on it or the minimum aperture on it is like f two point four, and um, so it's it's really bright. It's really sharp. Uh, it takes pictures a lot faster because I know it's got a faster processor in it. Um, and um, there's still some noise, but it's also a lot more accurate with the white balance. I think. Yeah. It's interesting because while we're seeing this kind of what what appears to be like the shrinking of the the um, uh, pocket uh, digital camera market, we're also seeing this creation of a new kind of a market, which has been defined by this Fuji X100, which came out recently that everyone's, a lot of photographers I know love it. Um, um, Zach Arias has one. Um, Nicole Young has one. Um, Brian Matias has one. It's like this little... Uh, in between, you know, size-wise, but they seem to love it because it's like this uh, retro look to it. Uh, it's the lens is fixed, it's locked on, it's not moving, uh, and and maybe it's the limiting quality of it in terms of uh, no zooming and all of that that uh, is appealing to them. But uh, I I plan to check one out pretty soon just to see what what all the fuss is about. But it's interesting that that little market starting starting to grow a little bit. I was going to say, if you want to go retro, you can just get a decal for your phone so it looks like a Polaroid camera. I think <laughs> yeah, it's just like nice too. 12 bucks at photojojo.com, which, by the way, is an extremely dangerous website for those of you guys that are into Yes, like, if you have not been there, and you're prepared and to spend some money. <laughs> Especially when they got um, those, those lens coffee mugs. Those were... People were clamoring for those. Well, and they even have... Um, they have those little... Uh, adapter rings for your iPhone that use little magnetic adapters that just have one adhesive on one side and then the ring is magnetic and so the lenses just snap onto the back of your phone and then you can use wide angle or macro or even I think telephoto so it's um oh, here we yeah. go yeah I see uh, Scott was mentioning yeah getting it to uh, trigger a strobe would be considered a replacement yeah. that is a good point Scott and I think that um on one has that software that's used for tethering, I believe, or remote firing for your phone um, that'll actually uh, do, um, I think it'll trigger and preview what your camera sees, as long as your camera is obviously um, on the same network that your phone is attached to. But I think what it does is it turns your phone into a remote triggering device, as well as um, I, I think, I'm not quite sure, but I think it'll actually allow you to see what the camera sees if the uh, mirror is flipped up and the sensor can see through the lens. So I thought that was pretty freaking cool. There's also, if you have, on a, on a side note with that, if you have an iPad, there's some app, it's something called photo, Shutter, Shutter Snitch or something like that that uh, sets up a Wi-Fi, if you have a Wi-Fi network set up on the iPad, um, and your phone has some Wi-Fi capability to it, it will it will dump the picture straight to there while you're shooting. Which nice. there there are a couple solutions out there. It gets into it gets pretty complicated when you're trying to do the whole wireless tethering thing and how you're gonna how you're gonna set that up. But uh, I, I like the stuff that Om One's been doing. Um, I have played a little bit with their a little remote for for shooting, and and I think that's on the right track. Um, I'd love to be able to. Take pictures, have it dumped to a, a laptop into, say, Lightroom, and then have like a copy of that or a low res copy of that go to an iPad while a client's there so that we're not all huddled around a little laptop display. Um, mm -hmm. You can kind of share it around a little bit. And you know, uh, Deb was uh, talking about how she's looking at getting a new phone, and you know, the camera quality is definitely a, a big, you know, plus for her as far as which one she's going to go with. 
And I, I got to say, yeah, you know, I, I kind of drink the iPhone, the Apple Kool Aid, but um, for me too, I think. And we'll, we'll actually kind of do a quick spin off of this before we get into the bridal stuff. Uh, Eric and I were talking about just the revolution of iPhoneography and everything else, but just the amount of apps that are available on the iPhone market compared to the Android market, which I know the Android market is quickly catching up, and a lot of apps that already have iPhone versions are working really hard to make Android versions as well. But I just, I've always kind of felt like um, um, that Apple the Apple market has always been kind of one of the first ones where most apps come out first and then eventually it gets adapted to the Android market. Um, but uh, with, uh, with with that being said, um, I've been posting some stuff on my Facebook, uh, just some, I do mostly, for those of you that don't know, I do a lot of uh, weddings and, and high school seniors and so, um, and bridal portraits and stuff, but um, I've been posting a lot of landscape photos on my Facebook thing, and Eric and I kind of talked about some of the potential things you can do with uh, with just you know your phone nowadays, and how remarkable it is, and how that's kind of changing the way we take pictures, as well as sort of um, revitalizing where we get our inspiration from. So, um, Eric, if you don't mind, I'll show them some of the pictures on my yeah. Facebook that we were doing earlier. Let's go for it. Go for it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And so, um, do go back to. Oh yeah, this is my little joke here. Dracula being stabbed. It's actually Facebook. You have to kill Facebook to take up time management to get your life back. Get your life back. Fight the undead. Okay, here we go. Little things. Okay, so pretty much everything in this folder here is just stuff taken with my phone, whether I go on trips or whatever. But um, this was when I was in Vegas at WPPI. Um, I think I took this shot with uh, my camera and then processed it through uh, Camera Plus app from Lisa Bettany. And um, uh, I think it was um, a mixture of using the HDR and, and Vivid as well as the Clarity feature. But um, it kind of gave it a, a much more illustrated look rather than just a straight-up photo. Um, but uh, some of the ones that I really wanted to uh, kind of show a little bit, we'll start here. Um, now, I know, uh, you know, especially mostly because of Trey Ratcliffe and, and a few others, HDR is really making a, a, a big revolution in the way people, you know, do still lives and stuff. And so, of course, I definitely wanted to, you know, take a shot at it. Um, so this was taken with my phone, and the uh, there are two apps that I use primarily for um, uh, for for doing my landscapes. One is called Pro HDR, and the other one is called Dynamic Light, and uh, both of them are on the, uh, the iTunes uh, iPhone market. I, they might have Android versions. I don't know. But um, the Pro HDR app actually will take two pictures at the same time and intelligently try to line up the shots um, so that uh, they overlap nicely and create this nice dynamic range. Um, it doesn't always get it perfect, uh, but I, I know that if you have like a tripod adapter for your iPhone, um, it would obviously be a lot easier. But it does a fairly decent job for, uh, for doing handheld, especially if there's a little bit of camera shake. Um, and then uh, this one was another HDR, but I really played around with it in uh, Snapseed. And Snapseed is an app developed by On One Software um, that has a lot of different cool effects. It's got some uh, kind of uh, different textural overlays. Uh, it, it also has local adjustments uh, to pictures. So you pick an area, and then you kind of select how big the brush area will be, and then you can decide on the contrast or the brightness or the sharpness or all that stuff on just a specific spot of the photo, which I thought was pretty uh, revolutionary for phone editing software on on a you know on a mobile phone, um, and then a few more kind of HDR shots. Um, the glow effect that I get for some of these, it's a filter inside the Dynamic Light app. It's called the Orton O R T O N filter. Um, it basically just kind of adds like a warm sort of wash to everything. And um, this is, again, me just getting pictures like around my house. 
Um, but these were the landscapes were kind of the first thing that I started shooting when I was uh, a, a college student uh, studying photography. Um, so for me, this was kind of um, kind of a, a way for me to get back in touch with what kind of got me started in the first place, uh, taking pictures. Um, and so it was really nice for me to be able to create something just for myself on the fly, um, and you know, had nothing to do with senior portraits, nothing to do with uh, wedding photos or anything like that. I wasn't get paid, getting paid to do these things. Um, these were all just things that I wanted to do for myself and kind of remind me you know, why I picked up a camera in the first place. And I think it really has a lot to do with just how easy it is to pick up your phone, uh, you know, take it out of your coat pocket and, and snap a picture, you know, edit what you want to edit, you know, how you want it to look, add whatever effects or do whatever you want to, and then share it to whatever sites you want to share it on, all right there from the same device. And I think that um, it's not really something that we need to be afraid of that, oh, the consumer market now has the capabilities to do what we can do. Um, they have the same tools, but it doesn't necessarily mean they can build the same things that we can build. It still has everything to do with your eye and your experience and knowing what apps to use and, you know, how you compose and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, but the fact that, you know, you've got this little device in your hand that allows you to really strip away all the non-essentials when it comes to uh, getting back to shooting what it is that makes you happy, I don't know. I mean, I could rant on about it all day, but... Um, for me, especially, it's it's definitely been like a good uh, revitalization of you know getting my creativity going again. Dustin, are you um are you kind of active in in trying out new apps specifically for HDR work? Do you? Yeah, I mean, I'm always uh, kind of seeing you know what else is out there. Uh, currently, the one that I'm using the most is the Pro HDR one, and um, I do like it. I wish that there was one out there, and maybe you guys know of one. Um, and I don't, but I wish there was one that would take more than just two pictures. Um, the one that I use right now, you um, you can do fully manual or fully automatic. The manual mode actually allows you to, it'll have two squares, so you'll pick one square and um, uh, say like, okay, one square will uh, be like where the brightest area of the shot would be, which would be the sky. The darkest area would be this part under the trees, and then when you say, okay, take the shot, then it'll expose for this area up here, um, making everything else, uh, you know, make the sky much darker, and then it'll expose for down here, making the shadows much brighter, and they combine the two. If there was one that actually took maybe four or five exposures and then combine them all, I think it would probably have much smoother gradations between the two zones. But for the most part, I've been really happy with this one. Yep. And that's the end of that, so. Deb has pointed out that it's kind of interesting that we're talking about this on Google Plus, but we're looking at Facebook for the <laughs> for the gallery. You know, Deb's kind of like I don't know if if uh, if we had a like a band, you know, for our show, and she was the one that was always interjecting little snide remarks and stuff. That would definitely be Deb. That would, that would be she'd be the right person for that. Wait, I, I correction. It was Destry, not Deb. Deb. Was it Destry? Okay. Yeah, Destry said that. But. Um, no, it is kind of funny though. I guess I don't know. Is it inherent in photographers to be kind of snarky? Is that is that just how it yes. is? Just how we are. Is. Um, okay, so um, I guess we will move on to the next portion of the show, which is going to be me kind of showing you guys my um, my bright, some pictures from bridal portfolio, and uh, kind of going over how we got the shots, that kind of stuff. So we'll just kind of jump right into it. I'm going to share the screen again and actually share screen. Okay, so let me uh, just enlarge this a little bit. And again, forgive me, I'm on PC, so I feel a little restricted right now. Sorry, Deb. <laughs> Okay, this is going to allow me to go through each one. Okay, so um, just to kind of uh, get started, these are all kind of I, 
I guess they're in chronological order. I'm not quite sure. Um, one of the things when it first came to, uh, for me, doing bridal portraits, um, I was kind of talking about it earlier before the show. Um, I always kind of wanted to be a, uh, like a fashion photographer, and the easiest way for me to kind of get into that and get paid was to uh, do bridal portraits. Now, essentially, they all wear the same outfit, but at the same time, it was an easy way for me to get to work with uh, brides and um, you know with people and, and get really great you know posed shots. Just kind of um, and and I think for me, I really liked the aspect of making them feel uh, beautiful and um, you know the whole idea of getting your hair and makeup done as well as getting to try out the gown before the wedding um, and you know go to different locations and stuff like that. Um, really, I think, gave the bride an opportunity to sort of put her personality onto print. And um, before I dive too far into this, um, I know some of our viewers uh, are in areas where we don't really do a whole lot of, you know, where they don't really do bridal portraits. And so just to kind of give you guys a quick background, um, bridal portraits are a very um, big tradition kind of in the southern portion of the United States. And I think a lot of it kind of has to harken back to of the Southern Bell sort of, um, you know, uh, time frame, you know, and I think that um, it's one of those things where um, it gives the mother of the bride an opportunity to have something, there we go, um, that, you know, is reflective, maybe not necessarily this photo, but is uh, reflective of, um, you know, their daughter before she gets married, um, Dustin, are you, are you looking at a photo right now? Because I'm seeing the uh, I'm seeing the grid. You're just seeing the grid, okay. but not actually a, an image. Gotcha. Okay, hang on one second here. There we go. How's that? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. So, um, yeah, this first one's definitely not reflective of what a mother of the bride would probably want to see, but um, uh, but you know something along the lines of like this where. Um, you know, it, it still kind of retains an image of innocence, but at the same time, it's like it's about documenting a transition from being, you know, a young woman to uh, to being a wife. And I think that especially, you know, moms uh, down here, they're the ones paying for the wedding photography, or they're the ones telling their husbands, "Hey, pay for this wedding photographer." So we definitely want to kind of cater to uh, the the mom's, um, you know, wants and needs for what she wants from this wedding. Plus. Um, a lot of what we do to kind of sell the bride on the idea of doing bridal portraits is, you know, we tell them, look, <clears throat> your mother's going to want something from this wedding, and if it's not a copy of your wedding album, she's going to want a big, a nice picture of you. Um, and the other nice thing is it'll give you an opportunity to try out the gown, you know, get some hair and make it on, and kind of move around in the dress, you know, to see how it feels uh, before the wedding day. Plus, you know, we offer bridal portrait packages that include uh, 16 by 20, and then the um, the 16 by 20 can be shown on display at the wedding reception, and um, and then after the wedding, the, usually the mother of the bride will uh, will take it home and put it on display in their home. So that's kind of um, the pitch behind doing the bridal portraits. Usually, what I do is I just tell brides, look, it's a lot of fun. Bring your maid of honor along. Bring your mom along. Bring some champagne. You know, you'll get your hair and makeup done. Um, we'll kind of go all over town, do some really neat locations and stuff, and uh, and it gives the bride an opportunity to kind of feel like a model for the day and just have a lot of fun doing it. So, um, and just to kind of uh, put this out there, Eric, I'm not going to be seeing the chat window, so if anybody has questions while I'm going through these pictures, just read them out to me and I'll... Do my yeah, sure, and let me know when you're flipping images there, because um, you're still in the first one, right? Um, no, actually, it looks like it's not uh, changing. It's really interesting. Um, so, I'm see. seeing the uh, the brick wall one there. Okay, it's really strange because it's just only showing the first one, and I'm not even on that one. Um, okay, so let's try something different. Um, sorry, everybody, we're having slightly technical difficulties.
Hmm. Okay. So here's what we'll do. I'm actually just going to open each file here. So, okay, okay, so in the chat room, in the chat room, uh, we had a little comment by uh, Scott saying, "When it rains, it pours." And Deb, Deb suggested, "Blame it on the rain." It's probably your favorite song, which you know, um, a shot of the eighties. You know? It was, it was, yeah, it, and well, and um, it was. She's referring back to a running joke we had yesterday. Uh, uh, we had a common thread that just kind of got out of hand, and um, eventually. Uh, Millie Vanilli got caught up in the mix, and so <laughs> blame it on the rain. So, um, but uh, okay. So on this first picture here, um, this was towards the end of the day, and um, usually towards the end of a shoot, I'm kind of getting. Um, I usually get kind of frustrated with my uh, usual composition and stuff, so I start really changing it up, and uh, so I decided to go ahead and lay down on the ground. Now, what I've done is, um, can you guys see my mouse? Okay. Yeah, it seems to be around good. Okay. So um, off to the left side over here, I have my, um, I have an intern who is holding up a, uh, I guess it's like a five foot by three and a half foot uh, reflector. It's one of those that, you know, uses the PVC pipes to create a frame and then you just stretch the reflector material over the frame. Um, and it's, um, yeah, exactly. It, it's like a sun bounce, um, but it's it's not like the California sun bounce brand. I think it's um, uh, photogenic or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, but it's um, it's a pretty large size um, reflector. And usually what I try to do is there's gold and then there's silver and then there's white. Um, but there's also what's known as like a daylight temperature, which is kind of a mix between gold and silver, and usually that's the one I use the most. Um, however, this particular bride, she's a, she's a fiddler in a local Austrian, Austin uh, folk band, and so she really kind of wanted to have, like, a, not necessarily Western, but just more of like a, I don't know, kind of like a antique-ish sort of washed kind of effect, and so when I took the shot, um, I like playing with sun flare a lot, and um, I know some people really don't like using it, but I, I like using it when I feel it's appropriate. And um, where we were taking this shot, we had a nice breeze going, and of course I always, if I'm outdoors, which is 90% of the time when I'm shooting it's outdoors, um, I always have my bride face um, into the wind to keep the hair you know, from blowing into her face. Uh, and the wind just happened to catch uh, the lower portion of her gown just at the right moment. And so a lot of what this is is direct reflection from a, uh, the sun bounce off to the left side. And it's only about maybe four feet away from the bride. And if you look really closely, just kind of ignore the flare, you can see just how much, uh, how strong it is based off of see the, the contrast on the shadow here from behind the flowers versus where it is when it's not behind the flowers. It's a pretty powerful reflection. So, um, but even still, compared to the brightness of the sun, it just doesn't seem like it's as strong, but it makes for a really nice fill. Um, one of the things um, that I, I, I don't use all, all the time, you know, I only use it when, it, when it's necessary, is I don't use strobes a lot. Um, I, if I do, I use them for fill light. I don't use them as, as like a main light. Um, I try to use my, um, you know, the available light, but I try to manipulate the available light as much as I can to create that level of dimension to show, you know, that there is some dimension to the form, um, uh, to the person's face, you know, have a little bit of nose shadow, stuff like that, so it's not just flat, natural light. So I'm going to close that window, and then I'm going to pick the next one. Um, now, uh, this next one here is uh, one of my personal favorites. Um, this one ended up in uh, the bridal issue for Austin Monthly Magazine, uh, back in October, 
And this was actually taken at a restaurant that is no longer in business. It's called El Arbol Restaurant, and it was um, the interior was designed by a gentleman named Joel Mazursky, who uh, did a lot of the really neat clubs around town, as well as the apartment that all the people stayed in when uh, MTV's The Real World came to Austin. So it's like, oh, it's my little claim to fame here. So um, the um, the the neat thing was. Um, Actually, Rick Salmon approached me to uh, be one of his Friday Fab photographers, and he said, you know, uh, it, I don't do a lot of bridles, but you obviously do. Uh, would you mind doing a guest post and letting me showcase some of your work? And I said, yeah, of course, no problem. And uh, I was like, is there a particular you know, topic you wanted me to discuss? And he goes, well, you seem to be really cool with composition, so maybe do something like that. I said, okay. So I sent this image along with a few others, and he emailed me back, and he goes, are you joking? you're going to use this shot for an example on composition. And I, I emailed him back with a story about what behind this photo. And, uh, and, and I, you know, cross my heart, hope to die. It's the, the dead truth. Most people, when they see this, they're thinking, oh my God, there's a painting of a cow in the background right behind her head. And oh my God, that's a huge distraction. Yes, it is. But, um, for this bride in particular, she actually grew up, uh, on her grandfather's farm back in, uh, in Houston, and when she was in high school, she was in FFA, Future Farmers of America, and one of the things you do in FFA when you're in high school is you raise a calf, and then at the end of the semester, they judge the calf based on like how much it's grown and all that other stuff, and so she had a calf on her grandfather's farm that she had raised that she was really sweet on, and this cow reminded her a lot of that calf, and so she wanted to incorporate it somehow, but without making it super, super obvious. So of course, me being kind of the jokester, I was thinking, I'll, you know, let's do this. Let's have you sitting in front of it, and I'll have it to where um, it's kissing the back of your head. And as soon as we did the shot, I showed it to her on the back of my camera, and she fell in love with it. And this is actually the photo she ordered as her bridal portrait to have on display at the wedding. That's see, that's really interesting, Dustin, because that goes to show you that composition is not something only. Um that only has to deal with the viewer who just happens to look at the image for the first time and what they interpret from it. It can actually have a link to the the subject and the subject matter and the story behind those people, not just not just the person looking at the image. Exactly, and it, and again, really, what I'm out here to do is to make this bride happy and and do something that she had in her mind, and then make it come to life. And so. When she, you know, when she saw it, she kind of started crying, and you know, but she was really happy, and you know, I really enjoyed it, and so um, it was just, it was really cool. So um, I think I've got time for maybe one or two more. Um, let's see, uh, let's see if I can find one here that's just uh, a little bit different. I, I'm a big believer in um, using, uh, you know, definitely using what is available to you. But you know, also uh, manipulating it if it's not exactly what you need. And in this situation, um, this was taken at a nearby uh, resort. That um, one one part of the room was all windows. And so um, you know, I, I do love window light. For me, I always kind of picture it like it's a, a big you know soft box in a way. And um, the the problem is though, if um, you know, if you want to use a um, if you want to use window light, uh, you, you got to make sure that you don't just, you know, use the window and, and that's it. You got to, you know, definitely pay attention to all the other elements here. Notice all the lights in the background are off. Um, number one, because I don't want to mix all my color temperatures. Um, you know, I don't need overhead tungsten light, you know, bleeding all over the, the natural neutral balance daylight. Um, Plus, you know, I, I definitely, again, want to create a direction of light so it's not straight up flat, you know, shaded, you know, natural light. Um, however, uh, because of the distance between the bride and the window, there must have been at least 20 feet. This light was fairly contrasty. The shaded side was still, you know, fairly, uh, fairly dark. So, again, I had my assistant over here with... Um, with uh, the giant reflector that I like to use bouncing uh, back on the shaded side here. Um, but the funny thing behind this shot is that um, as I was turning the lights off in this room, I didn't realize that I actually turned off all the lights in the resort. So um, <laughs> they, uh, they came around the corner and um, 
the bride was, you know, having her wedding reception. She was paying big money to have her reception at this resort. And uh, they came around the corner and kind of getting ready to yell at me about it. And they turned around and they saw her and they kind of just stopped what they were saying and turned around and they said, okay, we'll just turn them back on when you're done. No big deal. So it definitely made me feel muy macho for a few minutes to kind of get away with that. But um, so uh, there's that one. And I think I've got one last one here. Um, tell you what, we'll go with uh, this one. And the reason why I'm going to bring up this next one here isn't because I think she's just hot as, you know, I'll get out, but it's also because um, the way I lit it was unlike any other way I've done it before. So um, this one was actually done in a bar uh, in North Austin called Bebo, and um, it's very, like, fusion Tex-Mex, uh, high-end, whatever. It's, it is just really cool. And this bride um, wanted to do just something very, very different. You know, her dress was like a champagne color and, you know, just did not want your typical bridal portrait. Um, the uh, the thing about this is, again, I am using, um, I am metering, including the overhead lighting and everything. However, um, the difference this time is that my main light is off to the side here, and um, it's a... It's an LED floodlight that I bought at Home Depot for $80. It's made by Husky. I think it has about 86 diodes, LED diodes in it. Um, I use an orange gel on it to warm up the light, and it'll hold a charge for almost four and a half hours, and it is bright. It's not too bright to where you could actually use it outdoors at noon, but it's enough to where it works great indoors. It creates, um, I, would, I would call it more like a grid quality type of uh, spotlight where it's definitely um, more straight on but it's still soft enough. Notice we've got the chin light here, uh, we've got the sparkle in the eyes, the shadows are, are non-existent underneath the eyes, um, but uh, you know we also have it mixed in with these two overhead lamps as well. Um, and for this shot really uh, the reason I composed it this way uh, was to go completely opposite of traditional. In fact, this bridal session almost kind of bordered on the boudoir kind of uh, um, area because of just the way um, the way she's posed, the, her expression, um, and just the overall attitude. I mean, the fact that we've got this whole lineup of alcohol in the background and the fact that the whole shot is angled off kilter. Um, but a lot of you may already recognize um, the rule of thirds that I've got playing on here. Um, you know, I do always try to pay attention to that when I'm shooting. Sometimes it influences how I shoot, sometimes it doesn't, but I am kind of a big, a big fan of being off-center because I do take a lot of time trying to figure out or help brides find locations that they feel are appropriate for the kind of bridal session that they want to do. So making sure that I'm not just getting a whole bunch of close-ups of the bride, which could be taken anywhere, you know, I do want to showcase the locations that we went to to get those pictures. And so, um, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, with that being said, I'm going to uh, open it up for any questions or anything like that. So... Dustin, I got a question that was in the it was in the chat room earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever find any brides that want this uh, this sort of bridal work in studio versus location or um, day of, or is it, uh, or do you ever actually? Yeah, do you get any of that kind of studio request? You know, um, I I don't, and I think it's because I'm really upfront with. Um, I only post pictures of brides that um, that I want to shoot more of, so. I, I don't do, if I do any interiors, then it's obviously not a standard studio interior. It's definitely going to be some on location kind of place because my facility isn't really set up to do full length bridal portraits. I, I have a very small, um, it's kind of like a pool house and it's just like a meeting house. I, I can shoot in it, but it's definitely not ideal for shooting, you know, quote unquote studio type bridal sessions. So majority of the time, if I have something on my site, it's going to be obviously a bride in a location that we've traveled to. Cool. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, you guys can open your mics up if you want to ask a question. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, if... Let's see. Oh, uh, Ron's asking, how much retouching do you get asked to do? Um, that's a great question. Um, obviously, um, not everybody you know looks the way they want to look or the way they picture themselves. 
Um, I include uh, retouching with the prices of our bridal prints. Um, I don't retouch anything unless it's ordered as a wall portrait or if it's going in an album. Um, and that those prices are different from like what people buy off of like the wedding site, you know, where it's only five bucks a four by six. Like, I charge much more than that. And the retouching includes, for me, if it's if it's being ordered as a like a canvas to go on the wall, it'll include uh, skin softening. I'll brighten the white part of the eyes, maybe even the eye color. Definitely, you know, blemish removal, straight hair removal. I'll even do body contouring uh, to a to a degree, as long as it continues to maintain a look of real, you know, realism. Um, but uh, ideally, my goal is to make them look like themselves, but enhanced without making them look, uh, you know, like somebody totally different. Like I still want them to look like who they are. I definitely don't want to do too much to a photo to make them look like this is how you wish you looked. You know, stuff like that. So, Destry is asking if I pose them. Um, yeah, I would say 95% of the time I do have to pose them, and the reason for that is because this is their first time, you know, being professionally photographed. I mean, maybe we did engagement portraits before that, but this is probably the first time they're by themselves being photographed by a professional. And um, yes, uh, a lot of times I am posing them. Um, I did actually uh, have to go to uh, classes to learn proper ways to pose uh, the female body because there are definitely proper ways to do it and ways not to do it. Um, but again, kind of like what was mentioned earlier, you know, the great thing about that is once you figure out great ways to actually uh, pose a bride, there are also uh, then you can get to the point where you can start breaking the rules and doing something different but still making it look uh, flattering. Cool. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Dustin. Appreciate that. That's some cool yeah. images. Um, just some uh, show notes, everyone. We are um, uh, next Thursday. We record this every Thursday, and next Thursday is, is Thanksgiving. So, Dustin, I'm guessing we probably will not have an episode happening on Thanksgiving Day unless you, you want to watch us. You don't want to hear the conversations that go around our Thanksgiving table, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. Unless you want to see a camera and a turkey <laughs> that's cooked. Um, but uh, Dustin and I did have a little meeting yesterday talking about some changes and some new updates that we want to do, rolling out to the site, some new features. So look for those in the coming weeks because we're pretty excited about uh, where we're going. Cool. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, this episode will be posted tomorrow at photog.tv. And outside of next week, we record every Thursday at 12 o'clock uh, CST right here on Google+. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for attending, everybody. <laughs>